Hey there, folks. I hope things have been going well for all of you. We have another problem for today, and it's this one. Unlike in the last problem, number 22, there's actually a picture in the description this time. So it's always a nice thing to see. Before we begin with part A, we will have to do a bit of setup first. Notice that the tension in these strings, well, that's acting at an angle. And without being provided the angle in, in the description, well, it's up to us to figure out what that is. And we can't do a free body diagram or anything else until that is complete. So with that said, let's take a closer look at our picture. I'll still introduce a coordinate system and some axes onto our block, but only to make something clear first. We won't touch any vectors just yet. Like I mentioned before, our tension is acting on the block at an angle. But the question is, what angle are we talking about? We've got two angles right next to the block right here, and then we've got two angles located next to the rod. So, you know, a perfectly valid question to ask is, which ones should we use? Well, the answer is that we're going to use the angles located next to the rod, these two here. Let's just start with the top one for now, and I'll label it theta. I know it might seem a bit of a weird choice to use that one, but this is where our coordinate axes and some geometry come to our rescue. Take a look at the y-axis here, and notice how it's parallel to this vertical rod. In fact, let me extend our y-axis a bit so that's more apparent. When we have a third line, like this string here, or multiple lines, doesn't matter, intersecting some parallel lines, well, we have duplications of angles occurring. And that means that we're allowed to copy-paste our angle into a new location. And in fact, I'll do that now. So here is the same angular measure as this angle over here. In geometry language, these angles are known as alternate interior angles. So this is what we will take advantage of in order to create our free body diagram. Before we do that, let's actually calculate what theta is. Instead of using this picture of a rod with a block attached by some strings that's spinning around, let's break the picture down to a simpler geometrical shape, an isosceles triangle like this. We can cut this triangle in half lengthwise using this gray line here, and I'll insert our angle theta. I've included it on the bottom as well because that angle is the same for the lower string due to the symmetry of our picture. Since we've bisected this triangle, we can rewrite the length of the base as instead of being two meters for the full length of the base, well, now we have one meter uh, lengths for uh, both sides of the halfway mark. Next, we can use some trigonometry to determine the value of theta. We have the adjacent length of theta, which is the one meter side, and we have the hypotenuse length for theta. That's the 1.25 meter side. Recall that the cosine identity is the ratio of the length of the adjacent side to the length of the hypotenuse side, just like this. And since we're taking meters divided by meters here, the units will cancel out, and we're allowed to take the cosine inverse of both sides, which will leave us with just a pure number. And if you plug this into your calculator and you have the degrees option selected, you should get the same uh, approximate angle of 36.9 degrees. While we're dealing with geometry here, let's also figure out the length of this gray bisecting line, which I'm going to label with a capital R, for good reason, because this represents the radius of the circle that the block is moving in, and it's sure to come in handy. One thing that we should notice is that we have these two internal half triangles here that contain right angles. Okay, one is here and the other is here. So that means we can use the Pythagorean theorem 
to get the value of r in just a couple steps. Okay, here's the first step. Next, I'll move the one meter squared quantity over to the right hand side, then take the square root of both sides, and bam, we've got r. It's exactly 0.75 meters. Great. Let's move on to the free body diagram of the block. Our first vector will be the block's weight, followed by the tension in the upper and lower strings, which I will label T1 and T2, respectively. If you've been paying attention, you might notice, hey, the strings were at uh, attached to the top and the bottom sides of the block, not the left. So why am I drawing them through the center? Well, it's perfectly fine to slide those vectors down like I've done here so that all of them act through the center. It doesn't change our angle, it doesn't change anything really, so it's perfectly okay to do that. Speaking of angles, let's insert those next. And remember, the top angle was the same as the bottom, so it's just being mirrored uh, across this uh, x-axis line here on the block. Um, with those included, now we can break each of these tension vectors into their components. The cosine portion of T1 will point in the vertical direction because of the location of this angle here, and the sine portion will be horizontal. It's the same idea for tension number two, except things are now pointing downward instead of upward. So the cosine portion will now be negative for T2. Finally, we have one last important piece to include, and that's the acceleration. Remember, when something is undergoing circular motion, it has to be experiencing centripetal acceleration, and that acceleration points towards the center of the circle. Since our movement is entirely horizontal, well, that means our centripetal acceleration will point in the minus x direction towards the rod. That's it. It's time for the sum of forces next. Starting with the sum in the x direction, we have three terms in total, and each of them are negative because they're all pointing to the left. Since both terms on the left-hand side contain a sine theta chunk, well, we can just factor that out, which will look like this. Keep this expression in mind because we'll come back to it in just a, a few moments. In the y direction, we have our cosine pieces pointing in opposite directions, like I talked about, so one is positive, one is negative, and the weight is also negative because that's pointing downward. There's no acceleration in the y direction, so the right-hand side is just zero here. Since part A wants us to solve for the tension in the lower string, which is T2, let's bring this second term here over to the right-hand side, like this. I'll divide both sides by the cosine of theta, and then at this point, we have values for both of these quantities on the left, and we can just plug them in to solve for T2. When I do that, I get the following answer for part A to three significant figures. Cool. Let's move on to part B. Here, we'll have to use two different equations that you may have seen before. On the left is our frequency equation, or in this case, rotational frequency, which is defined as the inverse of the rotational period. And here we have the definition of the rotational period in terms of the radius of the circle and its linear velocity, v, as it goes around the circular path. The idea is to bring these two equations together, and the equation on the left will go from 1 over t to this right here. So now we have a fraction in the denominator of another fraction. That's okay. It's a pretty easy fix. Whenever you see this situation, uh, you just flip the upstairs and downstairs terms in your innermost fraction. So now instead of v being in the basement, it's now upstairs and 2 pi r resides in the basement instead. Um, let's see here. Uh, we've already solved for the radius earlier, so the denominator is completely known. In order to proceed, we'll have to figure out what v is. We already have an expression involving that, as you might remember from our previous slide, from the sum of forces in the x direction. Okay, it's this one. 
And here's v, or rather v squared, hanging out on the right. Our first step is to multiply both sides by negative 1. If we're going to have to take a square root to get to v by itself, we can't take the square root of a negative number to represent a physical real speed. So here's the positive version of that equation instead. Next, I'll do two steps in a single line. The first step is to multiply both sides by r to get rid of this denominator. And then I'll divide both sides by m to get rid of this coefficient, which will look like this. Now we can take the square root of both sides, plug in our numbers, and I get the following for the linear velocity. To be safe, I've kept an extra significant figure just for now. Uh, we don't have to truncate v to three significant figures because part b isn't asking us to solve for that. So it's okay to hold on to it. With that known, let's go back to our frequency equation, this one. All of the values in the numerator and denominator are known, so we are free to plug them in. And if you do that, you should get this, but be very careful. We are not done yet. Notice the units here, revolutions per second. But then notice the title of the slide, revolutions per minute. Okay? We're going to take this quantity here and multiply it by 60 because there's 60 seconds in a minute. The seconds units downstairs here will um, cancel out with the seconds units upstairs here. And our answer for part B will be 45.0 revolutions per minute using three significant figures. And that is the answer to part B. For part C, we need to return to the free body diagram drawing board and eliminate T2. We've snipped the string, so the tension no longer exists there anymore, along with its components. Every other vector remains, though. So going through this whole process of labeling the vectors really isn't necessary. That's the only change. This change will, of course, alter our sum of forces expressions, as you might expect. The sum in the x direction only has two terms now and both are negative, like we had in the previous version. Since we know the process for getting the revolution frequency now, which involves solving for v again, let's get ahead of the curve and multiply both sides by negative 1 right away, like this. Similar to the x direction, the sum in y only has two terms as well. We'll take the weight and slide this over to the right-hand side, and then divide both sides by the cosine of theta. And now we have a new expression for T1. Our job is to combine both of these, which I'll do on a fresh slide. Let's take the right-hand side of the lower equation here and plug that in for T1 in the upper equation, like this. We can exchange the weight for mg and now let's do two things. One, divide the mass out on both sides, and then multiply both sides by r, which will give us v squared by itself on the right. Now you can take the square root of both sides right now if you want, but instead of dealing with two trig identities, sine and cosine, why not just deal with one? We already know that sine divided by cosine is tangent, so we can just plug that in too. That works just fine. Uh, regardless of what approach you take, we still need to do the square root and enter our values. And this is what I end up for the linear speed. It's quite smaller now, 2.349 meters per second this time. Let's go back to that frequency equation exactly like we did when both strings were attached. Okay, Changing a string doesn't change the equation. And now let's plug in that new velocity. This reduces our rotational frequency, as you can see here, to slightly less than half a revolution per second. We're going to multiply that value by 60 seconds per minute to get the units corrected again. And here is our answer to part C. One last part to go.
This last part, thankfully, doesn't require any kind of calculations. Let's bring our picture back into center stage, but it's going to be the picture once part C has happened, right? Because remember in part C, we snipped that lower string, but we were still able to get the block to spin in a circle. The rotational frequency, 29.9 .9 revolutions per minute, well, that's the exact value needed in order for this block to continue uh, undergoing uniform circular motion with the same radius of 0.75 meters. If we can't spin the block fast enough to hit 29.9 .9 revolutions per minute, then what will very likely happen is that the block's circular path will degrade and it will start wrapping itself around the rod, kind of like a tether ball wrapping itself around a pole. Now, I know this isn't the best picture to represent that. I'm not an artist, <laughs> forgive me, but hopefully you know what I mean there. That is all the parts finished. Let's review everything that we did on the solution card. So in part A, we calculated the tension in the lower string, which was actually less than half of what the tension is in the upper string. In part B, we used the free body diagram and the sum of forces in conjunction with the rotational frequency and the rotational period equations to calculate the number of revolutions per second of that block. Then we multiplied that value by 60 seconds per minute to get the proper units here of revolutions per minute uh, required for our answer. And then in part C, the lower string was snipped and tension 2 no longer existed. So we did the process from part B all over again, and as a result of that change, the rotational frequency suffered quite a bit and lowered to this value instead. And then finally, in part D, we recognized that 29.9 .9 revolutions per minute was the bare minimum rotational frequency required for the block to keep moving in a circle at the radius of 0.75 meters. With a lower frequency, we saw visually how it would very likely just end up wrapping itself around the rod and eventually uh, stop spinning. So that's it. All parts done. Thanks for watching, everyone. Have yourselves a great evening.